Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see you, Trevor. I'm gonna uh, looking forward to checking out your music here. So uh, let's uh, get a little underway, and I'll uh, get some new screen sharing happening in a second. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the MuseScore Cafe for today, April uh, 14th. 14th. Uh, 2022, and um, this is my regular series where we talk about some aspect of making music with MuseScore, and um, or not with MuseScore, just making music in general. And um, yeah, looking forward to checking out some music that's been submitted over the last couple weeks. Uh, obviously, lots going on uh, in uh, in Ukraine that's been um, in the news that we uh, are all concerned about one way or another. And uh, this is, uh, some people have written some music in response to this, which is fantastic. Always love to have music written in response to uh, particular topics and, you know, things that are going on and in your life or in uh, life in general. So, uh, yeah, so um, Trevor, if uh, I'm going to extend you the invitation here to, um, to uh, participate here as a co-host so let me um do that there and then if you feel like coming on uh feel free to do so and uh here you come hello i see icon not hearing voice yet so you might need to unmute because unfortunately i don't get control over such things so still not not hearing your voice, um, but uh, I'll tell you what, uh, while uh, we figure that out, I'm going to start the music, and um, uh, yeah, let me just check my device again, make sure I'm sending. There we go. Uh, there we go. Oh, hello. 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 There we go. All right. I'm. I, there's going to be a little echo until I switch this to my headphone again. Try again. Hello? Much better. All right. Perfect. Now I can hear you. Trevor, it's great to, uh, you know, meet you a little more face-to-face uh, -face here now. Likewise. Thanks for having me on. Sure. So um, what, uh, you know, we're going to play through your piece here and um, the, the Ukrainian Rhapsody here. And what, uh, what other than, you know, obvious things do you want to uh, tell us about this before we play through it? Because I just want to play through the whole thing and just... Uh, you know, listen without uh, without having to comment about it in the middle. And, you know, so if there's stuff you want us to be listening for or thinking about, tell us. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I think I posted a brief kind of synopsis um, a couple weeks ago when I mm -hmm. posted this to the community. Um, yes. But I can just kind of touch on that again. Uh, That's good because not briefly. everyone saw that. And I saw yeah. it two weeks ago. And that doesn't mean I remember everything either. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess as soon as I heard about what was going on in Ukraine, I was, uh, pretty affected by it. Um, I'm part Ukrainian on my, uh, mom's side and ah, grew up with a yeah. lot of, uh, Ukrainian traditions and art and dance. So, um, yeah, I just felt kind of compelled to write something with a bit of a Ukrainian influence to it. So, um, I guess more in the kind of the middle section of the piece, it's a, it's a roughly kind of a ternary structure, uh, is largely based around, uh, Ukrainian dance music, specifically a dance called the Hopak, uh, which oh, is yeah. in two, four time, very, uh, rapid dance featuring lots of crazy leaping and jumping. Uh, it's quite, uh, quite lively. Um, so I use the medieval funeral chant, uh, Diaz Ire to kind of, as the basis of the melody for that section to, so that's kind of a bit of a, a dark twist or commentary, I guess. And then, okay. um, that comes back in the minor mode, I guess, if you will, kind of at the end of the piece against the opening theme. Okay. So, yeah. Um, Oh, and then the middle section of the middle section is, um, I guess it's kind of a ternary form within a ternary form. 
uh, is kind of based around a kind of processional dance that you would often see uh, female Ukrainian dancers uh, mm. perform, like a, okay. a very slow, uh, graceful, sad kind of dance. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So I don't have too much more to add now, but right. uh, yeah, that's great. And then we'll, you know, dig into different parts of it and talk about some things and uh, just, uh, you know, reflect on how the music relates to whatever we want to relate it to. So, uh, all right, everyone, I'm going to uh, um, mute myself and Trevor, I'll recommend the same so that uh, we, uh, um, you know, aren't uh, uh, picking up our voices uh, while, uh, while this is playing. Actually, I can't mute myself because I'm using the same same mic for both. The, but anyhow, you you mute and it'll be better. Okay. So here we go with uh, um, Ukrainian Rhapsody um, from Trevor. Hello. Start.
Yeah, yeah, Trevor. All right. Um, yeah, come come on back and uh, unmute. That's that's really a fantastic piece. There's just so many great things about it. And uh, as I recall, you're you you're a pianist, and you um, uh, I'm assuming have worked out the playability of this for you, right? Yeah. I mean, I can't play through it perfectly at the moment. It's quite difficult. Like I'm not a professional yeah. pianist. I, yeah. I, I'm decent. I don't play as much as I used to, but, uh, yeah, I like, I'd have to practice this a lot to get it, uh, up to yeah, performance standard, I... but, <laughs> but, uh, definitely playable for any virtuoso for sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, has very much the feel of, you know, a lot of list pieces and, you know, pieces that were written for virtual pian, written by virtual pianists for virtual pianists so they know uh, what's doable. The only thing that gives me any pause about that is where is that one place where there's like a, there's like a big f uh, octave chord with a trill on top. With a trill on it, yeah. Um... <laughs> Notation wise, Where, that looks kind of funny. Um, I kind of played around with it, and it's it's doable. Obviously, the uh, the bottom notes of the chord. Oh, a couple pages back there. Yeah, a page. Uh, there Here. you go. Yeah. Um, so this is a B major chord, and so yeah. in order to pull off that trill, I got to be able to play this B. I got to be able to, uh, that's a, that is a stretch for me. And then to be able to pull off that trill, that is the only part that when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, I, well, I basically intended for that, that the, you know, the lower notes of the chord wouldn't be held. You just kind oh, of. Oh, I see, because it's roll. Yeah, you spread yeah, them quickly. Uh, and... Okay, yeah, I, I uh, totally, totally get that now. All right, that makes <laughs> way more sense now that I, uh, now that I think through that. So now that you still super it awkward me. to pull off, but yeah, because I guess you wanna like when I did it, I rolled up to my fifth finger on the B, and then kind of did a quick little change to build a trill. Yeah. Even if I tried to make the roll up to my fourth finger, my my hand's not very comfortable with that. But I probably don't really want to trill between my fourth and fifth fingers if I can avoid it. So I'm probably yeah. still gonna go five, four, three, three. three, three. <laughs> yeah, something have to like think that. About yeah. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so there was like a couple like other like really kind of really specific detail spots that I wanted to like, uh, you know, comment on, say something about. I see now the chat's got lots of uh, great comments in here, too. Um, so, yeah, I'll, you, and you mentioned the Hopak, and I'm I'm familiar with uh, the name and I've heard some music um uh, that has been labeled that way from that part of the world. And it. it I didn't know it was specifically Ukrainian. I know Eastern Europe in general. There's a lot of cross-cultural sorts of things. Yeah. Um, is so. What what else would you tell us about the about that dance about that style? Um, well, it is considered kind of the national dance of Ukraine. Um, okay. From the digging I did on it, it like it's one dance that is kind of more specifically Ukrainian. I think it's mm. might be used in in russia as well but there's probably some some differences there um i think where i've heard of it has been in con in context of either hungary or bulgaria or somewhere okay. else eastern european okay yeah i i can't remember i think i was doing a little bit of research while i was uh writing this and it, i think you're right i think hungary had something similar i don't know if it was under the mm -hmm. same name or not though um, gotcha. Yeah, and I, I know of it from by that name only because of that, but I'm not saying that oh, okay. it originated or anything. Just that that's something that I knew of in in uh, that association. Okay. Uh, but yeah, and of course, part of the problem is Ukraine as a country hasn't always been identifiable as a country. It's been part of Russia. It's been part of absolutely. Other things. Yeah. And so that's definitely a big part of things. Also, so culturally, it's probably always been associated with that area. Uh, it just has been under different uh, different management. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have too much else to say about like the dance itself. Um, it's yeah, origins well, are kind of allegedly as, um, a dance of, uh, Cossack warriors, um, 
kind of legendary kind of wild um, Ukrainian warriors that inhabited uh, the steppes or the, the prairies in central eastern Ukraine. But apparently it originated as kind of a wild victory dance and or as training for battle or something like that. So, okay. <clears throat> nice. Yeah. Um, so um, the, the couple th things that I, I would want to um, ask about it uh, more specifically, uh, not about the whole pack, but about just general. So like there's a lot of different sections to this and um, the section that ends up being the longest to hear is the slow section, right? The dance of yeah. the maiden section. And um, it's it's labeled uh, Dance of Maidens, and I, uh, you know, that just off of the name, it's like, oh, it's just a, you know, pretty whatever thing. But of course, we know the context of this, and they are probably not dancing for any happy reason, right? And there's a uh, sure. sort of a deliberateness to the fact that this kind of takes over, because that's kind of the the idea that this is the most I don't know, noteworthy thing. And then there's all the other aspects that are woven in, but we're, mm. in, is the idea that we're meant to focus on, on this slow, the slow section. Yeah. I, I kind of thought of it and kind of came together as, you know, kind of the, the focal point of the piece or kind of the emotional center of it. And, uh, the, the melody there is based off of, uh, the opening melody as well. Ah, okay. Yeah. And that's one thing I hadn't, you know, I'm, I'm hearing it for like basically the second time here. Cause I try to, sometimes I try to come in with like specific ideas, but sometimes I like to come in fresh. Da, 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 dum, da, 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 dum. Um, and yeah, that is definitely, uh, da, 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 It's definitely, uh, the, the same basic melody. Um, <laughs> it's actually interesting to me because, uh, in my, uh, 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 musicianship class I was teaching earlier this morning, we were doing uh, some ear training and we're using uh, Hotel California. And uh, okay. that melody is essentially Hotel California also now that I look at it, just oh. uh, for what it's worth. <laughs> it's, it's not exactly the same, but it's a similar, just hang on one pitch, go down a step, hang on that pitch, then go down a couple more steps. So it's it's got wow, a very, never... very similar shape to it. Never would have thought of that. Yeah, it's totally different. It's it's a silly observation, but uh, it's it's you know, uh, if I if I did it that way, it'd be okay. Uh, something like that. I forget. Da, 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 uh, um. Anyhow, it's it's a lot of those same pitches. <laughs> Um, I see what you're saying. So, yeah, yeah, it's uh, I'm having to like transpose it from the key that we did it in, and it's not it's not right. Um, but yeah, the the um, the the use of the melodic material helps tie things together to reuse material. And so like, you know, we've been talking some about form and analysis, and like we're talking about this project of maybe trying to like come up with some analysis of of Brahms. Uh, first symphony and the first movement in particular, and it's it's a long work. It's you know twice as long as this, yeah, uh, which is for typical sure. for a, a symphony movement. But what over the course of the fifteen minutes, there is not necessarily more melodic material than than mm. what you have here. It's just you know that much more repetition, that much more development of it, and that idea of reusing material but casting it in a different light, using the same melody. Uh, as um, this, uh, right, uh, that form that is e, the same melody that we hear. I'm not going to try to play this because, oh, no, this is slow, but still, I'll let Musicore play it. Right, that's definitely the same melody, but in a different rhythmic context, a different key. This is this is uh, really good stuff that you all want to pay attention to. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, the things that I notice here is like when I, I often talk about harmony, because that's, you know, a place where I often live. And the harmonies here, I, it does move through different keys, but within the keys, it does, you know, relatively um, conventional things for the styles that they're trying to be. And one of the things that I want to observe here is the way you've got these chord voicings. 
uh, basically this F sharp minor chord and then going up to the B. What it really is for anyone who's like wondering, well, what is this thing here? I mean, this shape here is two perfect fourths, right? F sharp, uh, C sharp, F sharp, B. That is not necessarily, I mean, in jazz terms or rock terms, we call that a sus chord, but really what it is, is F sharp minor with some neighboring tones. The A goes up to B, comes back down to, and by playing the whole chord there, it gives it a very particular sound that it wouldn't have if we just let the one note move, because now we get to hear this whole sonority. That's not a sonority that you use much elsewhere in this piece, or am I mistaken? This fourth stack. Uh, no, it's definitely not something I use consciously yeah. elsewhere. I don't think it's, I think it's basically just in that section. And I, you know, I wasn't really thinking of it as a chord, anything other than F sharp minor. It was just, yeah. I it's liked the sound of it. Down. I, I thought it was a little bit dark and kind of hollow sounding and it was the sound I yep. wanted so I used it and it's a good sound and my so if all it was was this it would barely be worth a, a second mention because we would just perceive it as the neighbor tone but it's the fact that it's the tempo is so slow and it's interrupted so in, at the moment we hear this we've almost but not quite lost sight of where it came from and so we are that much more aware of this sonority and because it's slow it lasts that long and hollow is a good good word for it you also use a hollow sound like here where it's an open fifth and no third so these hollow sounds chords with no thirds basically mm -hmm. having an entire measure with no chord with no third in the chord Yes, that is a hollow sound. And hollow isn't a bad term. It's a it's a texture. No. It's a texture worth using, right? So we we use hollow sounds when we want hollow sounds. And so yeah, I think you successfully successfully made hollow happen. This if there was one note that I would think about differently it's coming up in this section here, and I need to think mm -hmm. about what it is. I think I know what the answer is going to be, but I need to hear this I think section I again. Double deleting note there. Um, no, I'm that not actually be... concerned about that. Although, oh, okay. if you're talking about right here, because this yeah. is just in octaves and in the chord, I don't care. No, what I feel like is as dark as this section is, uh, it's there's like a chord or two that's not as dark as it could be, and I want to see if, if okay. there's a note that'll change that. Yeah, it's somehow in this little, so this is, um, for those of you keeping track at home, this is basically 2-5-1 in the key of A major. We have B to E to A, and the B chord here is a dom is a is basically a triad, a major triad. So it's a secondary dominant. And this E against the triad creates this dissonance, which I'm not opposed to dissonance, but that's not my favorite dissonance. Um, and so, uh, is there something in particular that you, um, I don't know, are going for there that you don't want to lose? Um, it was more for the melodic line, I think. Yeah. Uh, is what I so, wanted there. Yeah. Okay. So if I were trying to make that melodic line happen over a B, Instead of actually playing the triad, just the plain triad below it, I would be looking for something that had a different type of dissonance to it. That's the only way I could look at it, because this is the dissonance that I'm like, feels out of place for it, because nothing else has that particular dissonance. This is one we learn right. to avoid, the third and fourth simultaneously. For so sure. one of the things is if just, if, you know, it had the E going to the D sharp there, that would eliminate that dissonance, but it doesn't make it darker. I want the darkness, and so it makes me wonder about uh, this kind of sound. 
um, basically uh, F sharp, half diminished type of sound with the B um, below it, if there's a way to make that happen. Which really creates basically the sound of, uh, oops, what the heck? Yeah, so it's it's really creating the sound of A minor to to uh, E. It's it's kind of a minor four approach to the A to the E. And to me, that level of darkness has its own dissonance that is more. I'm what, that's not the best voice leading in the world, but I like the sound of that. <laughs> and then it could still go there if you wanted. So that is the only chord in the entire piece that I look at and go, hmm, I wonder if there's a different voicing. So I just played it in this okay. voicing, but if you put it here, and you could either resolve it or not. Nowhere else are there two eighth notes on, on two and, so I wouldn't necessarily, but it is a slow enough tempo that it could probably stand that. Yeah, that's the only place where I look at it and say that's a tweak that yeah. um, might might make the harmonies gel a little bit better. Yeah, I like the sound of that. I'll have a look at that for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, because, yeah, so sure. Uh, and, yeah, because ev everything else, I mean, ev everything about the piece is just really fantastic. So many really nice things about it and different... Uh, um, uh, different sections, different rhythms, different types of harmonic territory that we go through, different keys we go through, and it all it all just works really well. And I'm I'm actually wondering now that I think about this, the fact that you were basically in F sharp minor, but you started in D minor, uh, how you got there, um, and so uh, you got there by going to A major mm -hmm. is how you got there, right? Yeah. So the the tie together entirety of the middle section i guess is kind of um a major so the a sections a sections of the middle section um starts in a major mm -hmm. goes back to a major and then f sharp minor is the relative right. minor so yeah and so like often we talk about related keys and unrelated keys when we talk about modulation and Ooh. there's no requirement that music modulate to related keys and starting around you know the romantic era is when it became you know popular to move to unrelated keys but even so there's usually a nice there's usually ways of accomplishing those modulations that kind of ease things and this particular way he's got going here he goes from a very clearly uh, very clearly D minor section, and then at the end of that D minor section, he hits the D major chord, right? And D major, that would be a Picardy third, to use that terminology, ending a minor key section on a major chord. So he's got D major. Now that he's established D major, so D minor to D major is a related key as far as that goes, same tonic. But then going from D major, which has two sharps, to A major, which has three sharps, it's only one more sharp, so that makes it related also. So you go from D minor to D major, a related key, and then from D major to A major, a related key, and then A major to F sharp minor, related because it's relative. And so you end up by these leaps and bounds going to a key that's quite unrelated from D minor to F sharp minor from one flat to three sharps is a long ways but you took us there um, quite gradually in fact if I just play that section we will hear that So when, once we land in A major, it feels perfectly um, expected. And the first hints of the F sharp minor start happening somewhere. So I forget where they start happening. But in any case, that, that idea of moving through keys kind of gradually, if this was 
Mozart, he wouldn't have gone through so many unrelated keys so quickly, or, you know, he would have gone through a related key, but then come back home, go to a related key, then come back home. This is our journey from one related key, and then, oh, now we're going to visit your relatives, and now we're going to visit your relatives, and now we're going to visit your relatives, right? And uh, by the time you get to the end of it, you're not necessarily so related anymore, and that's part of what gives a piece like this its character. Thank you. Do you you think about that kind of scheme much when you're doing this or is it? Yeah, Yeah. um, absolutely. And I see Sora just asked a question there as well. If I kind of planned it out ahead of time, Um, I knew that I wanted um, a major for kind of the overall B or middle section Mm -hmm. um, of the piece. just because for the like for the whole pack for the dance part of the piece i wanted a major key um yep. oh so and by the way i even forgot that you actually go to e major too right yeah <laughs> which is another sharp and then that you will you know, pull back again so anyhow sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but oh no no all good yeah. yeah so um instead of doing the relative major of um of d minor so instead of doing uh, B flat major for the for the middle section. I just I figured I'd go to a sharp key for kind of a, a more colorful yeah. contrast, and it's easy enough to just take the dominant of of D, so A minor, just make it major, <laughs> yeah. and then for the entire middle section to go to the uh, the relative minor, F sharp minor, and then mm-hmm. those little contrasts in there, like you just mentioned, the E major section. And then to get to that F sharp minor, I kind of went through the circle of fifths um, through some minor yeah. keys and major keys. Can't remember exactly yeah, what it, I it would, did there. Went through yeah. like starting B here, minor. we're in A, and now. So if you follow yeah. that sequence, F sharp, B, C uh, sharp major, C sharp. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's moving through some different things and that's how you kind of know, oh, something's coming because it's going through these quick series of modulations and that's, um, yeah, that's all, all good stuff, all stuff to like everyone should have in their back pocket when you want to set up some sort of change going through this quick series of modulations is, uh, you know, that's how it's done. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I kind of had like the general plan um, for the keys overall, but like that one section uh, modulating there, I kind of came up with it to get to F sharp minor. So, yeah, I mean, some of it was planned, some of it I just kind of worked through. That, that makes sense. And he, here's something I always kind of ask myself and wonder about. If I write a piece that's like this, by which I mean a bunch of different sections to it that get kind of glued together. Um, I rarely write it start to finish. I I often, you know, write bits of this section, bits of this section, this bits of that section, and then glue Mm -hmm. them. And sometimes when I do that, I'm already attached to the key that I wrote those sections in, and I make that work somehow. I write the modulations I need to write. But sometimes... I will look at a section that I originally wrote in one key and then realize, well, based on where I want to put this, I, um, I actually feel like I need it to be in a different key. And then I'll change the key. I'll, I'll basically transpose the piece from, or transpose that section from where I wrote it. I don't tend to do that often though. Did you, did you find yourself doing that at all here, writing something and then changing its key? Uh, no. Uh, not in this case, no. Um, I think I have ended up doing that in some previous pieces that I've written. I couldn't tell you when or where, but yeah. but usually, like you mentioned, um, I'll have kind of the main material for some of the main sections, and then um, I have to kind of go back and work out the the transition material. Yeah, and one of one of my. Um thoughts about this that I I really try to keep with me is if I write two sections of a piece, even if I write them on different days and I don't know what order they're going to go in or anything, some part of me knows 
that they're going to fit together. If I wrote mm -hmm. them the same day, they are related. And so even if I'm not aware of the relationship, I usually trust that there is one and I'm going to find it. <laughs> and then I find a way to make that relationship work. And sometimes it's unexpected. Oh my gosh, I just discovered this relationship. And it could be something really weird and obscure, like how I related Hotel California to that. That was me imposing something in my brain um, that wasn't there. But yeah, I think usually it is there. And if I look hard enough, I can usually find that. And it is worth doing that because it helps the piece hold together. If, if your original vision for a piece was in a particular key, that's probably for a reason. And probably it's worth trying to figure out a way to make it work. Yeah. Uh, something interesting that ended up working um, kind of nicely is um, my original theme for the opening section. I didn't mm -hmm. originally plan to um, to use that in counterpoint with the uh, Diaz Ire in the base, but ah. it happened to more or less work. Like I had to shift some things around a little bit, but yes. uh, I almost kind of lucked out with that. Yeah, and that, but, but see, this is the thing. I believe that is not luck. I think some part of you that wrote one theme had that in your mind while you were writing the other section and some part of you knew it um, <laughs> it was going to do. Because I've discovered that also when writing larger scale pieces where sections that I had no idea were going to relate to each other, it turns out they did. And yeah, I just don't believe that's coincidence. I'm... Uh, I, I really believe that's, that we have awareness beyond what we're consciously aware of, and that can cause us to do some things that are good for reasons that we don't even know. For sure, yeah. That, that makes sense, for sure. Yeah. So Dave is asking, and then I'm going to uh, wrap this uh, portion up, but uh, as far as the um, filling in gaps, uh, because we, we've talked to some about modulations, and you have that whole series of modulations that you went through there to mm -hmm. get to F sharp minor. Basically, do you write that forwards and stop when you get to F sharp, or do you work backwards from the F sharp until you find yourself an A, or some combination of those? That's a good question. Um, yeah. Honestly, I don't remember entirely how that section came together. I, I know that I wanted to get to F sharp minor. Um, there you go. But so at measure, some level, you worked backwards, but only perhaps knowing your goal. Yeah, yeah. And then like that section uh, at the bottom of the page there, 116 to whatever that is at the end, um, like it's in C sharp major, and then all of a sudden it goes really dark, and we're in F sharp minor. So I'm going to listen to this. Yeah, that suddenly suddenly dark because that f sharp minor wasn't directly led to um in the way we were expecting it to so yeah yeah so it's kind of it's almost like the reverse of the uh picardy third yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're expecting, so we're expecting it to... major and you're giving us minor there yeah that yeah is good, good observation. i don't know if there's actually a name for that there there isn't that i know of and it happens relatively seldom but when it does, it could be quite effective. Um, yeah, there's a, a piece that I know that I, I love, and I've, I've mentioned it before, called Sail Away by Tom Harrell, a jazz trumpet player. And it's in the key of C, and it's bum, 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 but it's all, you know, nicely C major. So it does a lot of beautiful things harmonically, but the ending is. the only C minor chord in the entire piece. And it's like, oh, someone just Dark. sailed away. That's um, yeah. the idea. Yeah. It adds a certain darkness, for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much for being being here and sharing this piece with us, Trevor. Um, thank you. I really so appreciate much. it. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Cool. All right. I, uh, there, I don't think you have the ability, unless you see a button, to uh, leave as co-host, but I have the ability to sign you out. So thanks again, Trevor. And right. thanks uh, so much, hope Mark. to check out some more music. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do next.
next is, uh, you know, I, I, that was a big piece and I wanted to spend some time on it in there, but we got two other pieces I want to look at and basically we'll play them and just have a brief little chat. Um, so uh, w one of the pieces here is uh, from Humble New Music who may or may not be joining us today and I'm going to give them as long as I can to get here. And the other is from Dean. And actually I should check to see if you have made it here. Uh, looks like Humble is not here yet, but Dean, I will uh, invite you to come join us if you like. And I'm um, just going to hear your piece and uh, uh, you know, talk uh, a little more briefly about this one because we spent so long on the other one. But um, uh, anything that you want to share with us, go ahead. But in the interest of time here, I'm going to... Uh, did I hit the thing that says invite? I think I did. I'll do that again. Um, I'm just going to uh, start playing it, and then if we have something to talk about, we'll talk about it. Um, this is one that had, we talked about some in the community discussions about the English horn, how it's being used, and how it's, it's, it's a very effective sound, um, but maybe some questions about its range and its capability of, uh, of, of having the particular dynamics we might, we might want it to have to cut through. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk. Yeah, Dean, just absolutely beautiful. And yes, uh, I hope you're hope you're recovering uh, nicely from your your operation, and um, and that all is well. Um, this, yeah, this piece is beautiful as well. Different character from the other one, but equally, you know, just just gorgeous. Uh, so there was a couple comments that came up in the discussion, and yeah, ideally I would have that really handy. Let me just see if I can try that again to get to Dean. If I go here and then find uh, where he posted, 
uh, the piece. There we go. So there's a, a few things that he mentioned here. Um, uh, you know, so obviously about telling the story about the war and its effect on people is, you know, we, we, we're familiar with the, the overall setting in which this is taking place. Um, then he talks about some more specific things uh, musically about how this happens. And he mentions that the, uh, the, the rhythmic flow and key center are difficult to discern at the beginning. And yes, this was uh, absolutely true. And if we think about why this is true, um, there is, uh, it's, it's in 6-8, but how obvious is it that it's in 6-8? I would say maybe not that obvious because we don't hear the repeating groups of threes in any, re in any repeating pattern that would allow us to make sense of it. In other words, we get right off the bat two quarter notes. Now, if I didn't know better, I would have heard bum, bum. Let's see, I'll play it. Bum. Oh, it's transpose. Concert pitch. There we go. All right, that's what we think is happening. We don't have any frame of reference to understand that it is anything other than that. Bum, 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 bum. Right? Bum, 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 bum. As far as we know, that's what's happening. It's not until we get later on a little further into it that we start hearing rhythms that suggest the 6-8 a little more. Still not really there. I, actually, I don't even know that I ever really hear the 6-8 until here. Now it's more clearly because we get the dotted quarter note pulse. But until that point, Dean has very kind of carefully avoided telling us too much about 6-8. Um, and so that's a, a deliberate choice that, that he has made. And sometimes we would notate that kind of passage, a, you know, without even bar lines or anything or without putting a time signature on it. The fact that it's actually notatable in 6-8 is almost an accident. Is it completely an accident? Well, no, because it really is the melody that eventually we are going to hear that exact same melody with only slight variations but with the accompaniment. Now we can hear which is the beat. And I had no idea that that was the beat before. First I thought it was bum, 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 bum. I thought the D was on the beat. I thought the C was on the beat when I first heard it. But now we're hearing it over a different rhythmic context. So in a way, this harkens to the thing that Trevor did of having that one, my, that one, right? But then later, um, or however it, it, it did, the same melody, but over a different rhythmic accompaniment. This is a similar kind of thing conceptually. makes total sense. You know, it, 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 it sounds like it makes sense in 6-8, and yet it is not, it is not like, it's not an Irish jig 6-8, right? It's not, it's not trying to do that thing. It's a very loose 6-8. I mean, look how many ties across things, ties into a beat. There's a tie across the bar line here, and then tied across the bar line. Tied into the beat, tied across the bar line, tied into the beat, right? So it's got that flow to it. And then instead of just always being about three eighths, there's sometimes dotted eighth, sixteenth eighth, and variations on that. Here's eighth, dotted eighth, sixteenth, right? So variations on this rhythm. So we don't get locked into a specific rhythm. It has a very, what I would say, organic six eight feel to it. So it as opposed to a dance-like feel, it's more organic. I, those words aren't necessarily in complete opposition. Um, 
But anyhow, that's the, that is the distinction that I would make here. So the, the one part that I am most curious to try something a little different in is in this part. So at some point, we're going to talk about HARP because HARP is its own thing. And, and so I understand that you had uh, some help with, uh, like, making sure that your HARP part made sense. And uh, that's a whole thing to unpack. And we've got a harpist who just uh, has uh, been posting recently. And so I'm looking forward to talking more about HARP. But I, I am a little concerned that the harp is going to be buried. Like this is beautiful, right? But now when the strings come in with it too, um, if this is meant to be, like it says violins, if that's meant to be a violin section, like an actual string orchestra, you could have them play as quietly as they want. They're probably going to drown out the harp. Harps don't project that well in that kind of context. Now, if it is just a single violin, single viola, single you know cello, that or the cellos aren't doing it. But it, it's it's definitely a balance consideration I would be aware of. One thing that I might do is select the beginnings of those phrases here and uh, let them be more harp-like by making them be pizzicato in that spot. So I just want to hear that. Anyhow, that's a, you know, the, the MIDI representation of it. it. That's not necessarily exactly what it would do. So muted strings. So yeah, that was the other thing that I would say. If you don't literally play pizzicato, but there's a number of techniques you can do involving like, yeah, putting this physical thing that you stick under the strings that mutes them. There's also things you can do where you play closer to the uh, bridge that will uh, also have some of this uh, effect also. And um, so yeah, that, that would be something to think about if there's a way to make the harp uh, project more over the other stuff and have it all fit together more. By the way, Dave is also asking about uh, gradually working into a time signature. Yes, absolutely, you can do that in any meter you want, having that sort of thing. The other comment that I made is, uh, Dean mentioned the idea of the high note at the end of this phrase being scream-like, and I don't know that an English horn screams at the top of its range. I think it whimpers a little more. that note, that high G there, like it's not, I think an actual English horn playing that note, um, especially once it's, you know, in, you know, as written, that note is a high D. Um, I'm not so sure that that projects as well. And the, the thing that I had suggested doing is delaying, oh crap. Wow. Oh, what was that? Okay, I'm back. Am I back? Someone please comment and let me know because my screen went dark for a second and I was afraid it had crashed and then it came back. So someone please comment in chat. Let me know that I'm, I'm still with you. Um, I would like to think that I am still with you. Um, as far as I can tell, I am. So um, I'm good. All right, yay. So what I want to do here is I'm going to cheat. I'm going to, well, it's not cheating. I'm going to insert a beat here. So I'm going to go into node input mode and press control, shift. Actually, I'll come in to the top staff and type in node input mode, control, shift, D. And that inserts a D. And uh, I didn't pick a, a time for it. Let me actually do that again. And this time I'm going to say I actually only want it to be a dotted quarter. So I'll say five dot and then control, shift, D. And now I'm going to tie that there. And so what I'm doing is I'm going to let that note be heard all by itself before the rest of the chord comes in. And maybe the, they'll be done pizzicato anyway then, because these chords won't, won't sustain <laughs> pizzicato. So at that point, we should come back with, with, with Arco. Anyhow, that's a little orchestration trick you might, um, you might think about trying when you, when you have a note that you're not afraid, you're, you're not sure if it's going to cut through, 
above what you've written, but you don't want to change what you've written underneath it, let that note be heard all by itself briefly and then bring in the thing underneath it. And it's a nice little bit of drama too. So it's about, it helps with the balance, but it also helps with uh, drama also to do that sort of thing. So anyhow, uh, great job, Dean. And uh, I want to see if Humble New Music is here, but uh, he had mentioned, t told me he probably wouldn't be. I just want to play his piece since I said I want to cover these things. So Dean, thanks so much again for your lovely contribution here. And um, feel free to continue to go back over to the community and discuss this more. Um, I'm going to play Humble New Music's Ukraine piece. So he has this uh, thing that he's um, been doing on a number of pieces of mapping notes to letters, or mapping letters to notes, I should say. So the letter A is, you know, becomes the note A, B becomes B, C, e. but then H becomes A again, I becomes B, J becomes C. You know, we, we basically keep cycling. And you can make up different schemes for this. But as a way of generating melodies from words, you know, it's a way you can do things. Um, and sometimes you get melodies that might be unexpected melodies, and then you see if you could excuse me, if you can harmonize them in a nice way. And uh, I think he's done a great job here. So let's just listen to this and then maybe continue the discussion in the community. So here we go. Another just beautiful piece. Um, and, you know, the things that are going on in this harmonically are unlike uh, things that other people have been doing. And uh, I definitely am very interested in talking more about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, th so these letters that you see here, they're not lyrics, right? This is how that melody was generated by using, like, the secret code of mapping these letters into notes. And um, there's something about this uh, sequence of chords that reminds me of... Chopin prelude. That 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 Chopin prelude. There's something about this that's reminiscent of that. The slow moving melody on top of these chords that shift one note at a time. So it really and and that's what happens. Yeah, there's a chromatic bass motion and everything. The way these notes, the voice leading between these chords, the voice leading is what tells the story. Because harmonically, it would be harder to explain these chords purely harmonically. And the same is true about that Chopin E minor prelude. It's really hard to analyze a, a good chunk of that uh, piece. As, as popular and well-known as that piece is, and as simple as it seems on the surface, there's stuff going on harmonically that sort of defies easy explanation. And I think the same is true uh, of this piece. Um, now, the only thing, yeah, so that is that is something that I'll be interested in, in looking at a little bit more, and maybe we can uh, talk about on the community. But uh, for now, I'd say, um, you know, my time is up. Got to be uh, getting on to my next uh, classes and so forth. So I want to thank Trevor, thank Dean, thank Cumberland Music uh, for the beautiful music that uh, we've been hearing, and that hope you've enjoyed the discussions and um, the, the sort of observations 
decisions that we've been made and that we can all hopefully learn from each other and what we're doing. So uh, with that said, I'm going to sign out here. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being here again. This is what we do every Thursday, look at some, some aspect of making music, writing music, creating music. And, uh, you know, in the background, those of you who are All Access members, we've got this thing going on with the Brahms Symphony trying to work on, and we're still trying to sort out just the big picture uh, um, form on that and where the different themes are. And every once in a while, I'll bring people up to, to talk about aspects of that uh, Brahms Symphony so that we can uh, learn little bits of that while also talking about all the other things. So keep writing music, keep submitting music. I look forward to talking about your music in the future. So uh, thanks, everyone, and see you next time.